in light of our theme today of psychiatric emergencies, we actually should start at home, right? Uh, I think it's the second line of the Hippocratic Oath that says, Physician, heal thyself. Uh, with that said, we have Dr. Michael Myers, uh, clinical pro uh, professor of uh, psychiatry here at SUNY Downstate Medical Center, and he's actually going to talk to us about uh, some of the things that pretty much all of us in this profession and taking care of people uh, have to just be really, really aware of in order to do the best possible job for our, ourselves and our patients, of course. Thank you. So welcome, Dr. Myers. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, good morning, everyone. Some, uh, some of you may find me familiar because at orientation to your residency and fellowship, I'm the guy who does a little bit of sort of welcoming and talks a little bit about physician health at that time. So I'm happy to be here this morning. I'm going to go over the slides pr pretty quickly because I know we don't have a lot of time and I'm hoping that there'll be some Q&A. Okay? So that's my disclosure slide. So what I'm hoping is that you'll come away with a sort of sense of of what stress is like, what burnout is like, what depression is like, PTSD, anxiety, et cetera, et cetera. Um, ways that we can sort of take better care of ourselves despite systemic problems, and then some strategies in coping after the tragedy of suicide uh, of a medical peer. Okay, so what about stress? Because it's kind of just a very general term, okay? And if you can just have a look at some of those things there. It's basically this sort of sense of, you know, just an inner sense of something being different. And uh, that's where you just got to pay attention to your gut. Because basically what you're realizing is that I just don't feel like I usually feel. Okay, so it's very, it's very general. It, it crosses on a lot of very different things. And it isn't, it isn't necessarily diagnostic in terms of DSM, but it's just that you feel stressed. Um, and also, it can be physical as well, and that's why any of you have primary care physicians, sometimes you go to a, a primary care doctor and because you're having so many different somatic symptoms, not necessarily felt symptoms, and uh, your primary care physician should be able to help with that. Okay? So these are basically, you know, just some of the general things that you can get. So then we move into burnout, and as you probably know from the medical literature and even the lay press literature, it's all over the place. Um, in the House of Medicine. And it's roughly, the ballpark figure is roughly 50%. The studies vary, there's all kinds of research and papers, and there's questions about methodology and stuff like that. I wouldn't get into that, the point is, is that it exists. And it's unfortunate that it does, all right? And you're in a branch of medicine, and I think there are various reasons why burnout rates are significant. And maybe at the end, I'd like to hear a little bit from you as to maybe your thoughts about that, because there are some things that you're, definitely your specialty has done in working on to try to reduce the rates of burnout in EM residents as well as practitioners uh, that can be done that are uh, specialty specific. Okay? The main thing is it's not just about hard work, because most people in medicine are used to hard work. It's got to do with uh, a sort of hard work with a sense that there's not enough reward. And by the way, that's why I said non-financial, because I've looked at, in my practice as a physician and health specialist, I've looked after doctors who are mega wealthy and are miserable. So they're in a branch of medicine that pays well, but the reward that they're getting from their work is gone, that sort of thing. The second part is what we call personal agency, not enough autonomy, not enough say. And even though your residents, those of you who are, you can still have a fair amount of autonomy if you, if you look at that and look at your assertiveness. Okay? So those are some of the things you see, the so-called loss of empathy and decreased personal, professional effectiveness. You feel like, I'm doing all this and yet I don't really feel good about it. it I, it's not turning my crank, so to speak, to be colloquial. Okay? It's not just fatigue, an erosion of the soul. Those are pretty powerful words, especially you know, for what drove you into medicine in the first place, and then specifically into emergency medicine. Medical errors. That's what's really important about the burnout literature. And those are ones, of course, that we may recognize ourselves, but we may not. And so others do. And this borders that sometimes on medical legal stuff. But it is true. That's been researched, that we're more prone to medical error when we're burned out. The other thing that I like to tell faculty, too, that if they're burned out, it can be contagious because trainees 
pick that up, and it, then it becomes kind of a systemic sort of burnout atmosphere, and that's not good either. Okay, you're less satisfied. There's complaints about your you're less. It's a spill over to your personal and family life. I always tell people who are in any kind of relationship, anything about their family, leave your ego at the door. It's extremely important to listen to our loved ones. There's usually an initial defensiveness. What me? That sort of stuff. Especially if they're criticizing us about our use of alcohol or street drugs or just our mood or something like that. But when you can kind of calm down and realize that. Mostly, they're on your side, your children, your spouses. It's very important to pay attention to what they have to say. This is a not uncommon complaint that I would get, like somebody calls me up and wants to come and see me. And there's this question of, I don't know whether it's burnout or whether it's depression, and they don't want to quit their job just in case it might be a mood disorder that requires treatment, that sort of thing. So it's a very common chief complaint. In, a, in one that a mental health professional can sort out. Okay, remember burnout is an occupational definition. Depression is an illness. The biopsychosocial underpinnings are extremely important. You know, we could have we could have genetic loading, can run in families, that sort of thing. But the psychosocial factors are very important. And so, in the treatment, when you prescribe some medication, that's just one part of it. The psychotherapy part is extremely important. But it's serious, and if it's not properly treated, it can kill. All right, so this is all very important. That's why it's if somebody thinks they're burned out or whatever, it's not a good idea to quit their job, because I've looked after a lot of physicians, if they can just be patient, give me a chance to kind of figure out what the diagnosis is and treat them. They will know in a month to six weeks, or maybe two months, what this is, and then they can make decisions from there as opposed to kind of, you know, premature retirement or, or inappropriate retirement. Anxiety disorders, pretty straightforward. Basically a general nervousness or perhaps phobias, that sort of thing. PTSD, I've been really looking at the research in that the last few days. I've, I've got to give a major talk next week on um, faculty wellness for the whole sort of Mount Sinai system. And um, um, trauma surgeons, and emergency physicians who are doing a lot of trauma work, there's a proneness of PTSD. It makes sense, that sort of thing. Again, it can be prevented and it can also be remedied, but there's specific approaches that it has to have. But see, there's a tendency for us to see ourselves largely as strong kind of macho types that this stuff really doesn't affect, but it can get to us, that sort of stuff. So it can, um, in a sense, penetrate our, uh, what I call our character armor, our sort of uh, persona that we, all of us use in our branch of medicine to do, to do the good work that we do. Okay, so that's what's very important to pay attention to that. So why is this important? Okay, there's a lot of suffering physicians out there and a lot of doctors are not getting help and I'm going to conclude with some examples of that. We're trained to be healers. It's very hard to accept the patient rule. And I always tell young psychiatrists who are interested in my branch of medicine, physician health, and I'm trying to coach them, that they've got to be very patient when you've got a physician as your patient, that sort of thing. Usually they don't want to be there, understandably. We don't like being patients ourselves. And the stigma is profound. You know, I've worked in a stigmatized branch of medicine all my life. By the way, I was an emergency physician for one year. That was before there was a residency. I loved it, actually. Uh, and then, uh, you know, switched, though, to the field that I did. But what my point, though, is about that is that it's just, it's, the, the stigma uh, is very hard. It is, even, even if we're in a kind of accepting atmosphere, it's a residue from growing up in a society that has viewed psychiatric illness, mental illness, as strange, as weird, as a weakness, or something like that. So that's why I always tell my junior colleagues, you've got to be very patient and very empathic and very kind. And it can kill. Uh... This is Dr. Peggy Watanabe, who's an OBGYN and the widow of a physician who killed himself in Indiana. And I've come to know Peggy quite well, and her two sons are both attorneys. I interviewed her for my book, and she also is trying to make a plea out there. She's doing a lot of public speaking that she feels that we people in the mental health field, we need to educate more. 
in general medicine about some of the common things for physicians to look for. Because we can't assume that, you know, what are you going to remember from your psychiatry clerkship or something in, in medical school, that sort of thing. We've got to talk about it more. She says if she only knew so much now, or if she, if she knew then when her husband was so ill, what she knows now, she really likes to believe that she might have saved his life. It is true that a lot of the symptoms we can get are elusive, and not just the non-chemical psychiatric symptoms. I do assessments for the Committee for Physician Health, and that's kind of tricky too, because the individual not, may not necessarily show the signs in the workplace, and then they can be very confusing. What appears like maybe a substance use problem is it, or the other way around, that sort of thing. And so that's why a lot of this is really very important. And a thorough uh, biopsychosocial assessment is really key. All right. Let me see. What was that? What else did I have here? Yes. When you're not feeling well, it's awfully hard to make phone calls. I often tell people, if you're worried about a colleague, don't just give him or her names to call somebody. It's best if you make the phone call for them and set that up. And when I get those kinds of phone calls, say, from a fellow resident or a fellow medical student, or even a fellow attending, I'll say, and if you can, come to the first visit with her and just wait on the way to go. That will ease the journey. So you don't feel so alone. Because there's a terrible sense of aloneness. By the way, any of you in this room who have ever suffered from any form of psychiatric illness in the past, you'll know what I'm talking about. Okay? And, by the way, there's this myth out there that the last thing that goes in terms of our health is our work performance. There's some truth to that, but there's a lot of untruth to that as well. That people who are working with that individual can see that you know, he isn't on top of his game as he used to be. It appears that he is or whatever, but there are these sort of micro changes and perhaps micro errors that occur. Michael, can I ask a question? Yeah. Uh, what, what extent, when you are in that situation, you want to refer a colleague, a friend, uh, to what extent do you impinge on their freedom? Because if they, I mean, physicians particularly are probably very resistant, as you pointed out, to, to acknowledging that there's a problem. Yeah. But you as an outsider can probably see it much clearer and want to refer that the patient that the patient or that, that person doesn't want to. Right. You know, how do you not impinge on their freedom? Okay, so what you're describing, the question has to do with, in a sense, how it's about reaching out, I think. How do you reach out without sort of impinging on somebody's freedom or autonomy, civil liberties, civil rights, that sort of stuff? Um, and maybe kind of, you know, have them recoil, that sort of thing. It's a process, and it's a dynamic that varies from physician A to physician B. What I always tell people, though, and I've, sometimes when I have more time with groups, we'll do role plays. So, because there's a way of kind of modeling outreach that is more likely to be successful in the person sort of acknowledging or opening up. But yet, that's not 100%. But the vast majority of people will actually welcome some sort of personal, confidential, one-on-one, -on -one, private overture by a colleague or a friend. And, as a, and those are descriptive act adjectives, that, uh, things that you need to do, uh, where they feel safe to kind of open up a little bit. It gets really tricky, though. If the individual is quite ill, you will get pushback. The individual may be quite paranoid by that point and, and often litigious. And so all you can do, of course, is back off, that sort of thing. But I always tell people, that could be diagnostic, that this is an individual who is not well at all and really does then need a thorough assessment. And that, in a sense, is when you kind of have to move it up sort of the hierarchy. And it could mean that the individual, like forcibly, has to be taken off service. And, it usually, and often those individuals are not happy about that. The most common diagnoses and those sorts of things are uh, an occult substance use disorder that's been very tricky that the individual doesn't recognize, especially especially cocaine, ecstasy in younger physicians, um, sometimes intravenous drug use as well. We know about fentanyl and things like that, that sort of stuff. But that plus or minus a mood disorder and sometimes an undiagnosed or unrecognized what we call bi bipolar 2 illness, where there's been dis disinhibition 
and some quite inappropriate behavior that everybody's noticing except the individual himself or herself. So it is very tricky, but the point though is, is that I believe very strongly that we have to be our brothers and sisters keepers in medicine. And how I know this is not only just hearing it so much in my practice, where I've really heard it from are doctors, from doctors who are now well. But that's down the road. And they look back and many of them with tears in their eyes will say, I would not be alive today if it weren't for my colleagues strong arming me and getting me out of the emergency room and into an office and into a doctor's office or into the emergency room or into a treatment center or whatever. I was furious. I was threatening this. I was threatening that. But I couldn't see what a fucking wreck I was. You know, that sort of stuff. But remember, they're down the road now. This could be a year into recovery or something that they can see that. But they are very, very grateful. So that's my point. We do save lives by reaching out to each other. <coughs> Don't blame yourself. Burnout is largely systemic. And it's going to take a while, though, for all these changes. I'm very active in ACG, I mean, in the physician health protocol that's been, well, it's been started now. The third symposium, annual symposium is coming up in November. The National Academy of Medicine is examining this. There's a lot of national bodies, the AMA, and I certainly know that your major groups, ASAP, and you've got <coughs> two or three national emergency medicine groups, to my knowledge, are also sort of looking at this. But it's going to take time. In the meantime, though, there's certainly things that can be done. Oh, okay, so that's the slide there. I put a lot of resources in the back of this book that I wrote because, by the way, I wanted to just tell you that I wrote this book uh, because I wanted the voices of people who care about doctors to be heard. My voice is in it as a clinician who looks after doctors, but it's largely the stories of grieving families who have lost a physician loved one to suicide. Also, I interviewed training directors, I interviewed classmates and roommates of medical students and physicians, I interviewed deans, I also interviewed some patients of doctors who have taken their own lives. So that's, it's their book, their stories, and they've got a lot to say, and things that, why they want to make a change. Okay, so these are some of the things, and for many of you, this is a little pet, these things are basic, it's incorporating them that will be a challenge, all right? Okay. I was interviewed yesterday for this, but why is she, she's the woman said to me, she's not in she says, why are you such a stickler on doctors having a primary care physician? I said, because of the fact that I think we should just be like any other citizen. Yes, we're trained in medicine, but why should we have a primary care physician? Because as you know, the tendency is for doctors to make a little bit of a self-diagnosis. They, ooh, I think this is hard. I'm going to go to a cardiologist. Or they're having trouble peeing and think, oh, I better go to a urologist. You know, I am 60 now and I've probably got a huge prostate. I've never had a PSA, blah, blah, blah. This sort of stuff. Instead of going to a primary care physician who's out there, you know, to look after as a generalist, that sort of stuff. Okay, so these are these are all of the things that you know are very basic that I don't know that you know about. Pam Swift, OBGYN, she retired from OBGYN after burnout and yet another lawsuit. And she's become a farmer. And she wrote this book. But what she's talking about here is a colleague of hers who died by suicide. They tried to cover it up at first and make it look like a single motor vehicle accident. But then it came out that she had actually killed herself. And Pam just felt awful about this. And she just felt this is somebody who fell through the cracks. She had talked with her once. She said, no, no, no. I'll never go to see anybody because it'll just fuck up my license. I'll never be able to get my license renewed. I won't be able to get malpractice insurance, et cetera, et cetera. <coughs> and several weeks later, she had dead. Now, I want, before putting that up there, I wanted to just tell you, because this is, this is really a key part of my talk this morning, because it's about Dr. Chris Doty. And those of you who are faculty or have been around for a while remember, will remember Chris as training director here at SUNY Downstate and he moved to University of Kentucky. And some of you will also know that he's been quite public about losing a resident to suicide last year. And the next slide is going to be on that. But what I wanted to just introduce this with is that um, I learned of this through so many of my 
contacts and everything. So I, I reached out to Chris and asked him if he would send me the email that he sent around to his colleagues, which he did. I spoke with him on June 1st uh, last year, and he shared the email with me, and here are the segments. Now, this is part of it, but so, so just take a minute to read this, and then I want to, I want to share my commentary with you. Okay? So the unbearable has happened at the University of Kentucky last Friday. We discovered that one of our residents was tragically taken from us, that they took their own life, grief over a morbid family member. He told me all about this in some detail. It's a catastrophic loss for our program, his family, friends. Look at this. Well, I'm immensely embarrassed that I lost a resident on my watch. And I think that you should understand that those of you who are residents, that most training directors and associate and assistant training directors take their job very seriously, and they care about you. Even if it doesn't appear that way all the time, they do. I'm a former training director myself, and I imagine even some of my residents felt, oh, Dr. Myers doesn't give a shit about me or something. Well, I'd like to believe that I wasn't always like that. He feels guilty that he didn't see this coming, etc., etc. I struggled on whether I should write this email at all, and that's the part that I'm going to comment on in a minute. I make this public to shine a bright light on a problem that lurks in the dark. Suicide, and specifically suicide in our trainees, is a significant risk, and we are at higher risk than the general public, which is true. Not just in emergency medicine, but we physicians in general. In order to face this issue, we must acknowledge its existence, you must speak its name. These are very powerful words. They're important words to me, again, as a sort of student of stigma. You must learn about it and talk about it. So what I did, I read a blog, okay? So I got hold of this. I got Chris's permission. I didn't publish this until I had, I had to take a look at it. And why I wrote this on the blog that I write that the subject isn't going away. I talked about my qualitative study that I just told you about for the book. The humiliation and fear attached to seeking help and the stigma associated with suicide need our undivided attention. Many national systemic individual efforts are underway. We have not, but we have not changed the hearts and minds yet of those individual physicians who faced with symptoms of mental health distress do not book an appointment with their doctor as they would do if they were having chest pain, GI distress, or hematuria. And that is true. The one thing I learned from my research with all these families is that there is a cohort of roughly 10 to 15 percent of the doctors who took their own lives who had not gone for any care at all. Not Didn't go to a primary care physician, a psychiatrist, a psychologist, a clinical social worker, the clergy, no one. They went from wellness to illness to death. And I think that this is unprecedented. I really do. I've never heard of a physician dying of cancer who didn't at least go to an oncologist once. I've really, I've, I've spoken about this quite boldly to my colleagues in the mental health field. And we have to do something about this. Yes, there are external reasons, but we can't just, you know, we have to do something to make it easier and safer for people to come to see us who are our fellow physicians. But most importantly, 